ladies and gentlemen. Um, so as, as you mentioned, uh, I, I, uh, I, wor I have worked both with, uh, as a reservoir engineer with uh, the Geological Survey and, and with uh, a bank, Glitner Bank. And, and when I was working with the, the bank, I, uh, I had the task of trying to decide um, whether we should lend uh, money into projects where uh, geothermal developers might have drilled maybe one or two wells and uh, <clears throat> they had to, had to get uh, financing to, to finish the last uh, maybe one half or, or uh, even, even three quarters of their project uh, where they would have to drill the additional wells and, and get money for the down payment on their, uh, on their power plant. So um, this was quite a challenge because you only have uh, a proven capacity for your wells up for, let's say, one quarter or half of, of what you want to produce. But, but, uh, and, and so there's a lot of uncertainty involved whether your, your next few wells will actually suffice for for um, filling up this, uh, the, the capacity of the, of the power plant and, and really knowing uh, or a structured methodology for knowing how big your power plant should be did not exist. And uh, that's some, a question that I, I sort of carried uh, in the back of my mind while I, I, went, I left Glitner and went and uh, did my uh, doctoral uh, work with, with Roland Horn. Um, and I've, I've sort of come up with a relatively structured methodology, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And maybe I should mention that this was not actually my, my uh, doctoral uh, dissertation work, but it's just something that I developed sort of alongside <coughs> that, that process. So <clears throat> the title of the talk is what, what is the ideal size of a geothermal power plant? And in fact, it's really, it's really um, about the way, what is the best way that we can produce, what's the economically best, uh, most viable way for us to produce uh, electricity from uh, a geothermal resource. So <clears throat> let's just begin by looking at the, the geothermal development timeline. And uh, this timeline usually, and, and we might have seen this uh, a few times before in this conference, it starts by uh, exploration and, and feasibility studies where you, you might uh, do a lot of geological surveys and, and maybe drill one or two wells. And then you come to this, this decision point that I mentioned before where you need to put down a payment on a geothermal power plant when you still don't really have all of the wells that you need to provide energy for that power plant. So that the, uh, you, you put down the money and then maybe one or two years later you actually have the power plant constructed and then you operate for a few years and now you get all the data and you realize and you can see whether you can actually uh, pr provide enough energy for this power plant and, and maybe you, could, you will come to the point where you realize, okay, the, this resource is actually a lot bigger than I thought it was and you might decide that you want to expand <coughs> your power plant and, and you, you have another decision to make. And this time your decision is a lot more informed, you have a lot less uncertainty, so this decision is is easier, in a sense, to make, especially with respect to the size of your power plant. So then you build your extension, and then you operate again, and you might even want to build a third phase. So <clears throat> let's have a look at a few variables during this process. In the beginning, let's just look at the cost. So as you are deciding that you want to uh, build your, your uh, first phase power plant, you, you need to put down a lot of money, and that's this, this high upfront cost that has been discussed uh, and in this conference at, and at length uh, in, in, uh, in the past about geothermal, which, which is really a, a hindrance to getting it, it going. And then the cost levels off a bit, and then it increases again when you, you build your second phase. And, and really, the question is, how should we uh, distribute this cost? Should we maybe build a small power plant in the beginning and then gain data for that, that sort of tells us how big the, the, the reservoir is and then maybe put down more cost and build a bigger phase uh, or, or a bigger power plant in the second phase? 
Now we can also look at the way that the data is accumulating. So the data is accumulating as we are in the operational phase. So that's where we are really seeing whether we have enough energy to support uh, these power plants. And we can also look at the revenue. So understandably, the revenue comes in as soon as you have your power plant online and you're, you're uh, uh, generating electricity that you can sell. Um, and one other viewpoint that we can, I can, I can highlight here is, is our uncertainty about the, the size of the resource. So at the first stage, we have uh, a large distribution in our estimate for the, the size of the resource. And at the second stage, that, that uh, uncertainty has reduced. And even at, uh, so at the third stage, we, uh, it, we more or less might know exactly how big our resource is, and, and we can make more informed decisions. So, <clears throat> so this is sort of an, an introduction to, to uh, uh, the problem that we're looking at. And uh, the, the question that I'm really trying to answer is, how should we be producing from these reservoirs? Should we be producing something like what I've showed here, just go up to some, uh, in, in one step, just find out what's the optimal size of the power plant produce at a constant rate for some X amount of years. We don't, I don't really know how long, but there have been <clears throat> numbers like 40 years, which is what many companies work with, 100 years or 300 years is what we talk about in the context of sustainable energy. So the question is, how do we start the production? How do we carry it out during the whole time? And how does it end? Do we just turn off the power plant, like, like we show in this picture? Or do we maybe build up in these modular phases, so we, uh, we build up the power plant capacity in maybe three or four phases, um, like, I'm, uh, like I show in this picture, and then maybe we ramp down again in, in a few phases as we uh, realize that, that uh, the resource is starting to drain and it's not, not economical to uh, maintain full production capacity anymore. And one other option here would be maybe to build it up in, in two phases with a, with a long uh, long production period in between, and then <coughs> maybe end the production by just stop uh, not drilling any more makeup wells and just let the production capacity just fade down as the, the wells decline in, in their compa capacity. So regulatory or, or legislative guidelines sort of push us to uh, try to produce in, in uh, a sustainable manner. And, uh, and that's, I think, very, it's, it's a good philo philo uh, philosophy. But the, the problem about that is that we don't really know what the sustainable production limit is uh, beforehand. It's, it's really, and number one, it's really hard to measure. And, and we can't really know it until we've produced from the reservoir for a long time. And it's also just rather poorly defined what the exact uh, sustainable limit is. And, uh, and in my opinion, this, the sustainable production limit depends on how you produce from the reservoir. So it will vary depending on the production strategy that you took. OK, so <clears throat> we have a, a little bit of a, a chicken and the egg problem. Um, so, but why should we even care about this? Well, first of all, it's in the economic interest of of the developers and the, and the shareholders. And, and in case of geothermal, there's uh, in a lot of the times it's, it's municipalities or, or states that actually own the resource. Or even if they don't own the resource, they will usually make some sort of revenue through taxes and other things. So it's really the, uh, uh, a social responsibility for us to try to maximize the long-term utility of geothermal resources. And, and in that sense, we are both trying to maximize economical viability, but we're also trying to maximize the sustainable production from the resource. So keeping that in mind, we don't, we don't want to be too aggressive. We don't want to ruin the resource by, by uh, producing too much from it. But we, we also need to be careful to not be too passive. I mean, it is the responsibility of those that are trusted with the resource to make the most of it. And, and and what I think is uh, something important that, that sort of came out of, of my thinking about this problem is that it, it 
improved at least my own understanding of decision making in, in geothermal development. And, and I'd looked into this for a little bit before, and I, I think there are some, there's some new value or, or new points that, that, are, that can be brought into the discussion um, uh, regarding how, how we carry out the development of our geothermal fields. Okay, <clears throat> so here's my suggestion for how I can, I can solve this problem. Um, I, I built a relatively simple financial model for how we produce from a geothermal resource and, and linked that to a relatively simple model for what the geothermal uh, reservoir, how it works, I guess. So uh, I put that into a mathematical framework and then uh, uh, ran that through an optimization uh, code to, to find what the, the best, what the, the optimal size of your power plant would be. And, and in fact, it, it decides how many wells you drill every, every year and how much uh, energy you would produce every year. So it, it's not only the, the size of the power plant, but the megawatts that you produce from the reservoir uh, as a function of time. And, and in a sense, we, we try to optimize the uh, profit from, uh, from this geothermal operation. Okay, so I'm just gonna go briefly through how the model works. So this is the conceptual model of the, of the geothermal reservoir. So the main reservoir has some stock of energy within it, and that main reservoir is in contact with a, a larger, a very large aquifer that, that feeds fluid into the reservoir. It might be a little bit colder. Uh, and then there's a heat source, there's the, the magma that, that uh, is heating the reservoir from the bottom. And these two, these two entities are, are recharging energy into the main reservoir. So when we come to an untouched geothermal reservoir, there's a, there's a balance in between these two. So there's, uh, there's no recharge into the geothermal, no net recharge into the geothermal uh, reservoir. Uh, but as you produce from it, you, you put in a well and you produce from it, you will change this balance and you will see more recharge from the heat source and the aquifer into the main reservoir. So your, your well will start producing at some high rate, but then it will decline slowly and you will come to a balance where the extraction, the additional extraction from the well will equal the recharge into the reservoir. Now, you can add some more wells. You could add, let's say, a couple of more wells and keep uh, producing from those. Then you lower the energy stock in the main reservoir even further, and you get more recharge into your reservoir, and you come to a new balance, which might be slightly higher than what you had with only one well. OK. <clears throat> well, then you go ahead. You have enough wells, um, and then you see then you see how much energy you can produce. So the, the energy that you can produce is just the number of wells that you have times the energy that they, they give you. So that's the maximum amount of electricity or energy that you can produce from the reservoir. And then you need to build a power plant to harness that or to generate the electricity to put it onto the grid. So the way, way the model works is that it says, OK, the size of the, uh, the power plant that you make is uh, uh, contains the total amount of electricity that you can uh, produce from uh, this reservoir. Okay, and then your profit, looking over to the money side, your profit will be the price of energy times the electrical energy that you generate. That will be your revenue side. And then there are a few cost sides. So there's the wells. You always need to pay for drilling the wells. You need to pay for drilling the power plant, and the bigger the power plant, the more the cost. And then we have to pay for operation and maintenance, so that's my work and, and some of my friends from uh, this geothermal reservoir or the, this geothermal site, so we always have to take our share, of course. Um, <clears throat> okay, so just having a brief look at how the math works, this is just the same as I was uh, mentioning before. We have the profit, which is the revenues the uh, electricity generation. Uh, we have well cost, the power plant cost, and the operation and maintenance cost, and then that's all multiplied with the discount factor, which is just taking into account the, the time value of money, you know, you know the, the 
a dollar today is worth more than a dollar next year or tomorrow. So that's, that's our profit, which we are trying to maximize. And uh, we need to uh, condition this equation to the, the re uh, reservoir energy balance, that, that uh, model of the, uh, of the geothermal uh, reservoir, which, which says that, that you always get, you get more recharge as you draw down the, the main reservoir and, and, and these uh, things. So well capacity, you need to drill enough wells to generate the electricity that you need, and you cannot generate more electricity than the power plant allows you to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that explains the model, and now I just want to go through a couple of examples of how you can use this model to gain some insight into how you might want to produce from a reservoir. Uh, the first example I'm, I'm going to use to look at the connection between a power plant size, uh, the power plant size that you choose, and sustainable production. And in particular, I'm going to compare uh, a scenario where, where we, we figure out what the maximum sustainable production from a hypothetical reservoir that I, I made. Uh, so we, we compare the effect of producing at the maximum sustainable rate all the way through the uh, life of the, of the project versus if there's no cap on how much energy you can produce and, and you just you knew the size of the reservoir and you just maximize the profit that you can get out of, out of producing from this reservoir. So the first, first step in, in this process was to understand what the maximum sustainable production would be from the reservoir. So you can do this by just looking at uh, taking this hypothetical reservoir that I made, I, I gave it some physical parameters and, and I looked at the sustainable uh, production limit as a function of the number of wells. So, like I mentioned before, if you put in more wells, you get more recharge and you get more uh, production from the reservoir. Um, <clears throat> so, as we can see here, at, well, you can imagine in this case that if you have an infinite number of wells, you will have a lot of cost related to operation and maintenance. <coughs> So if you have a lot of costs related to this, you would want to reduce the number of wells until you come to some sort of equilibrium of, of revenue versus operation and maintenance. This would be the maximum sustainable production that you get. The other extreme case, you can have zero wells and then you want to add wells until you, you make uh, the maximum amount of profit that you can take. But in this case, you always have to pay for a new well. So this br bring, brings you to a, the minimum sustainable production limit. But if, you get, if, you, if someone gave you a well uh, or a reservoir with uh, uh, the number of wells that was somewhere between these 20 and, and 37, which are, are the bracketing cases here, you wouldn't want to pay money to get another well, but you wouldn't also take wells out of operation, uh, but you would just stick with what you have. And that's the sustainable production limit. And that, this is the realistic scenario of what usually happens. There's, that's, that's to say that we have an, an energy resource that has additional capacity uh, beyond the sustainable production capacity, so we have an incentive to drill more than the minimum amount of, of wells that we would want to produce. Okay, so looking at, um, at the first scenario where we have a sustainable uh, or a limit on the power plant size, which is the sustainable production limit. And that's, that's the, the minimum limit that I mentioned on the slide before. And in this case, we, uh, we would just produce for a number of, uh, for uh, 100 years at this constant rate over here. And, and these, so that's the blue line on the graph here. And then um, we can have a look at the number of wells that we drill which uh, increase slowly during the lifetime of the project, and in the end, we, we hardly have to uh, add any wells to maintain full production. The stock in the reservoir is slowly declining, and the recharge is slowly increasing. Okay, so this is the optimal way to produce from, from a reservoir with this limit on the power plant size. Now, if we look at the case where there's no limit on the power plant size, we get this scenario. So the axes are all the same. They're all the same. 
but uh, so if you want to just see a comparison, we, we, we produce a lot more in terms of megawatts. We produce something like uh, 83 megawatts for the first 10 years, and then we, we uh, start reducing the capacity slowly, or actually quite rapidly, down to some uh, sustainable rate here, where the recharge that you can see on, on the, um, in this dashed line here is equal to the production from the reservoir. So comparing these two options, um, we can see that, that if, you, if there is no regulation on the optimal or on the, on the size of the power plant, you can actually produce a lot more, even though this looks like it's a bit aggressive. You uh, pr produce a lot more at the early stage, then you decline, and you end at a sustainable rate that's actually higher than the, uh, the, sust the fully sustainable plant size that you could go with for the entire uh, time that you, or if you wanted to just maintain a sustainable plant size for the entire 100 years. So, that it seems like it's it's more it's better in in every way to uh, just have no maximum uh, limit on the on the plant size. Okay, the second example that I wanted to go through uh, deals with the connection between the uncertainty and the plant size and those decision points that uh, you have along the the geothermal development timeline. So I'm going to begin by just looking at a, a simple example where, where you, we say that we knew the, the size of the resource, we assume that we knew everything about it, and we could just decide on the optimal uh, power plant size, and that's a solution that's similar to what I showed before. This is another hypothetical reservoir. And then I want to compare that to the case where you had the un uncertainty decreasing as a function of time. So the way that I, I modeled that was I made this, uh, this decision or this uh, scenario tree where uh, we need to decide on the size of the power plant at stage one, and then there are many different scenarios, and for each one of these scenarios, there's a, a new decision about the size of the power plant at the second stage, and there's a lot less uncertainty involved there, and then the uncertainty decreases even more for the third stage, and so on. So we, in this case we have multiple different scenarios and we need to optimize the decision on how big a power plant we build at stage one given all of these different scenarios that could happen. So this is what comes out of that uh, particular solution. So here we're looking at the megawatts that we, uh, we produce and if we look at, at the basic case before the maximum megawattage that we went to here was about 67 megawatts, but if we take this development in uncertainty into account, we would only develop about or build a power plant that's about 63 megawatts or so. So in general, what this tells us is, is that I think that the, the time value of money and the value of, of bringing the power plants online early seems to outweigh at least for this particular case that I looked at, seems to outweigh the benefit that you get from this slow modular buildup of the power plant and collecting all of this data uh, in, in uh, many different stages. Um, so really, uh, what I just wanted to mention here uh, is that I don't want to say that we should really build the largest possible power plants that we think might be feasible for, for a given resource. Also, I want to mention that it's not Landsvirkund, uh, which is the company that I work for, it's not their policy to uh, uh, discard modular buildup of geothermal power production. That, that is the policy of, of Landsvirkund, and, and they will not change that. Uh, and then um, I don't want anyone to take away the, from this that I'm saying that geothermal power production is unsustainable. I just think that it's more economical to produce it in a manner that isn't sustainable during the entire uh, project lifetime. So I, I just wanted to mention that, so th say that this is just a structured approach to determine the economical size of a power plant. The method links a simple reservoir model and a profitability model. 
if we have quantifiable uncertainty estimates, then those can be uh, implemented in conjunction with this model, and uh, more assumptions should be uh, taken into account, for example, something about environmental cost, and, and these could be incorporated into the method. Um, also, just to uh, reiterate what I've said in, in, with the two examples, is that there is a balance between taking small steps to gather data and re reduce uncertainty versus taking larger steps, which will inc uh, lead to increased economic viability and increased s sustainability, or a higher sustainability limit, I should say. And finally, experimentation with the model does indicate that power development in relatively large steps at the early stage is more economical and leads to higher, higher sustainable production rates. Of course, this can be hard to implement, uh, especially since uncertainty is very hard to quantify accurately. And I think passive decisions are, are actually uh, politically easier to make. Passive, with passive decisions, I, may, I mean sort of decisions to make small steps and, and to uh, not, uh, I may maybe go too far in in, uh, in our production or uh, predictions from for power production. Okay, with that, I, I want to thank you.